out of curiosity, I wonder if I could get a show of hands of how many people found out about the lecture through the Park Service website or an email that you got or something. If anybody who, how many people found out about the um, this event tonight through Channel Islands Restorations advertisement? Great. I'm just curious. That's another organization that I'm involved with. Who's one another group that you may probably a lot of you have heard of and some of you are members of is the All Eight Club, people who've been to all eight of the California islands. And one way to get to all eight of the California islands is through volunteer work on the Navy islands. And the um, Channel Islands Restoration is a way that you can get to the Navy islands if you volunteer to work on projects out there. So I just wanted to mention that. It's a really um, a great way. Those are very inaccessible islands for a lot of people, and it's a really neat way to get out to see some of the more remote islands off our coast. The Park Service islands, of course, are much more accessible, but the Navy islands are uh, remain a mystery to a lot of people because they're so difficult to get to, and they have some great opportunities to get out there now. Before I actually start with the uh, slideshow, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the maps that I've passed out. And please share these with people around you. I know that everybody doesn't have a copy of these maps. But there on one side is a map of all eight of our Southern California islands. But also, if you look on the south of there along the coast of Baja California, you'll see that there are a, a series of eight other islands. And all of the, when we have the island symposium meetings every five or six years, the all of those islands are included, not just the Southern California islands. We think of our islands as being isolated, but there actually are eight more islands to the south and a few more beyond that. But the, um, those, all 16 of those islands are considered to be part of the California island chain. Guadalupe is the most remote of any of these islands. It's 157 miles off the coast of Baja. And I'll say more about that during the slideshow. And you can see that it's basically um, located just a little bit to the west, but mostly due south of San Diego, about 200 miles south of our border with Mexico. It's the only true oceanic island off our coast. The other islands are sit on the continental shelf, whereas Guadalupe is a volcanic island that is not sitting on the continental shelf. If you turn the map over, you can see a map of Guadalupe Island, which, by the way, is larger than any of our Southern California islands. It's 98 square miles in size, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But also, it reaches an elevation of over 4,200 feet. So it has a very different climate at the north end of the island as opposed to the south end of the island. The, uh, and basically, as you get to those higher elevations on the island, you start picking up plants that are, Guadalupe has more connections botanically to San Clemente Island in our chain than it does to the Baja Peninsula. Lots of endemic plants, as Kate mentioned earlier, that's one of the unique features of the islands. These really special plants that are endemic to those islands. And the term endemic basically just refers to an organism, a plant or animal that has a very limited geographic distribution. And in this case, we'll be talking about tonight about some plants that are found only on Guadalupe Island, nowhere else in the world unless they've been planted, and many of them have. And But then also others that are found on more than one of our Southern California islands. The island itself, you can see, has a very unique shape. And it has basically large cuts out of each side of it. And it, they, the island is basically a, um, the remnants of the rim of large cinder cones. So you're just seeing that semicircular shape. This big cinder cone over here, another one over here. And those, basically, you're just seeing the island is, is the rim, the leftover rim. And the rest of those cinder cones are underwater. But it's a very unique place. It has its... I'll, I'll say more about it during the slideshow, but the, it's difficult to get around on Guadalupe Island, and several of the Baja Islands have this feature. If they're volcanic, the rocks are often too large to avoid, 
but they're really too small to give you stability if you step on them. So you're constantly kind of moving around trying to find good footing, especially if you're trying to go up a slope on Guadalupe Island. It's a very uh, difficult place to maneuver around. Um, San Martin Island off the coast of Baja also has that same kind of um, geologic feature where the there it's very difficult to walk around parts of the island and there there are lots of lava tubes that can be dangerous if you get um, stuck in one of those. But what I'd like to talk about tonight is Guadalupe Island which is take you on a, a photographic tour of Guadalupe Island and talk about some of the special plants and also the connections to our Southern California islands. There you can see a satellite image of Guadalupe way off the coast of, of Baja California. You can see the Baja California Peninsula there. Here's the peninsula. And then here's Guadalupe Island all by itself. As I mentioned, the most remote of any of our islands. And here you can see the, a similar map to what you have before you, the hard copy. But you can see it's about 200 miles south of San Diego. And there are a whole series of other islands off the coast of Baja, including Cedros Island down here, which is 134 square miles. So it's even larger than Guadalupe. As I mentioned a, a little bit about, the island is a, an oceanic island of volcanic origin. It's the westernmost out, outpost of the country of Mexico. Groundwater is extremely limited on the island. There are just a few springs up in oops, this part of the island is where the springs are located. And while you have that map out in front of you too, I wanted to point out some of the place names you can't really see. This is a slightly different map. But if you look on your map, you can see the high point. If you look on the left-hand side of the island, you'll see a place named Mount Augusta. That is right here. That's the high point of the island. So the island really loses elevation as you go down towards the south end way down here. And uh, the high points of the island are here and also in this portion of the island. There, if you, the cypress trees, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes, are located right here on the western side of the island, just to the west of Mount Augusta. There's an endemic palm and also endemic pines that grow on the island and they are located up in this portion of the island, the extreme northern end. If you come down on your map, you'll see a place called Campo Pista, pointing to a, a straight line near the middle of the island. That's the airstrip where planes can land. That's the only airstrip on the island. West Anchorage down here is where there is a um, a cooperative fish camp where they harvest um, abalone and lobster and it's run as a cooperative arrangement with fishermen who are citizens of Mexico. Campo Sur is where there is a Mexican Navy base and you can see that name on your map. And I'll also be showing you some images of the plants and the landscape of this outer islet which really is important because there were feral goats on the island. Before they were removed, the, these outer islets, these offshore islets, were the only places where plants could survive. I'll show you some pictures of what it looked like when the goats were there. and They now have been removed, but, um, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight, is just how things have changed since the goats have been removed. If you go now, go up to this northeastern part of the island, you can see some other place names, including um, Northeast Anchorage. There's another small base over here at Northeast Anchorage, a Navy base. Pilot Rock Beach is way up here, and that's where the elephant seals hang out on the east side of the island. Oak Canyon, which is right about in here, it shows on your map, and that's where some of the few remaining island oaks occur on the island. And the springs where the water are, the only place where you can really find fresh water on the island is up in this area 
near the cypress grove on the east side of the island. So it's 200 miles south of San Diego, 157 miles offshore, 98 square miles in size. It's about 23 miles long from tip to tip and about 8 miles wide at its, wi at its widest point and over 4,200 feet in elevation and an amazing island. Here's a view of, as I mentioned, it's formed by these large uh, cinder cones and here's the edge of one of those cinder cones. You can just see this really neat semicircular shape, but you can also see the, the way the landscape is arranged. If it's not covered with plants, and when the goats were there, there were very few plants um, to see on the island. But you, this is looking up towards the higher part of the island. These are, um, we're looking to the south, but you can see a few cypress trees over here. Really, just an amazing place. It's not an easy island to get to, especially as you're heading back to Cal Southern California. You're going against the current the whole way. And so, if there's any way to avoid a boat trip to Guadalupe, I try to do that. <laughs> the easiest way to get to the island is to land on that paved airstrip. But as you're approaching the airstrip, it, it doesn't give you a feeling of confidence that you're going to have a safe landing. There are numerous wrecks of planes around the uh, airstrip. I don't know the stories associated with all of these, but I'm sure they were not, not good. We've flown several times to the island. I was invited in 2001 to help a group called Island Conservation, which is located at UC Santa Cruz. They have originally had an office up in Santa Cruz, then also a, a satellite office in Ensenada. The Ensenada office now has split off from the California organization and it uh, has a separate nonprofit organization in Mexico called Conservation de Islas and they are headquartered in Ensenada. But originally they were part of um, Island Conservation which was founded up by Bernie Tershi and several of his colleagues up at UC Santa Cruz. The Mexican government, uh, the, the eradication and removal of the goats on Guadalupe Island really got started by island conservation. They proposed to the Mexican government um, that it was really important to remove these goats and they, it was much bigger than any other project they had done before. They mostly have been involved with removing uh, feral cats. They were involved in the removal of feral cats on San Nicolas Island, in our islands, but also on several of the Baja California islands. And especially with the um, work of Bill Wood, who is a retired hunter who used to um, hunt bobcats and now has turned his efforts to removing and thinking like a cat to remove the uh, feral cats that have really spread on a lot of these islands and are drastically affecting the ground nesting birds that are really don't have defenses against cats. So Bill Wood, he also trained a uh, Jack Russell Terrier for removing rabbits on San Benito Island and that a beautiful little dog named Freckles who he trained um, basically removed over 400 um, rabbits from their burrows on West San Benito Island, which is just amazing. The live forevers that are found only on San Benito are being eaten, as well as a lot of the other plants and the ground nesting birds were being affected by them because the vegetation was really being hammered. So really the uh, one Jack Russell Terrier made a huge, had a huge influence on San Benito Island. But anyway, we've flown out to um, Guadalupe several times, either from Ensenada or from San Diego, about equal distance from either of those places in terms of travel time. Here's one of the groups that went out there. This is a group of, um, there, as I mentioned, there is a Navy base down on the south end of the island. Here are a couple of the, the Navy personnel from the south end of the island. Um, there also are people from the Mex Mexican government and 
a group from Island Conservation shown here. Horns were from the, uh, the goats that were on the island. These were the, the old skulls of goats that were removed from the island. The island itself, the island is located right here. This is Guadalupe Island, but you can see that there's a unique, and you can look online, you search online, you can find some really interesting satellite images of the cloud wake that the island creates, including a whole bunch of neat little uh, squiggly clouds down here on the south end of the island. But as these prevailing northwest winds coming down the, the, this massive landmass that's over 4,200 feet at the north end of Guadalupe Island diverts the clouds around it. And as you're, that's one reason I think there have been so many plane wrecks on the island because there is a, you don't know as you're leaving the mainland, you don't know what the weather is going to be like. Before they had radios or way to communicate with the mainland, it was very difficult to predict what the weather was going to be. And you maybe, pilots didn't have enough fuel to get back to the mainland, but you could easily get fogged in there. And I'll show you several images in a minute that, that um, show the upper part of the island above the fog, but it's just amazing that those frequent fogs add a lot of moisture to the north end of the island. The south end of the island is much drier and is, um, it only gets about five, a little over five inches a year. And that's in a good year. This is looking towards that northern part of the island. You can really see, again, that fog bank sitting off the northwest end of the island. These are some of the endemic cypress trees in the foreground. Here's another view of the fog just dripping over the northeast side of the island. And that's where the pines grow on the island, up in that northern portion where that fog drip is common. Here's one of the endemic palms standing up right at the, and another one hidden in the fog. This is on the northwest side of the island. Here's one of the pine trees. But they don't get much above those foggy levels. Another view of the pines. So really just an amazing, amazing island. And that climate is really very um, predictable at the north end of the island, that fog. This could have been taken, this was on one of our expeditions, but it almost looks like it could have been taken 100 years ago. And it gives you that, I included it here because it shows you that constant fog bank that sits out, especially over the, the western side of the island. It's really exciting to see that. You always feel like you're flying above that fog bank as you're walking around the island. But again, you can see the way the, the boulders are arranged. These guys are really picking their way along with the horses through these really uh, rocks that are very difficult to maneuver around. This is where the spring, or near where the spring is located on the east side of the island. And the pines are located up along this summit here, up on the ridge of the island, and especially on the part of that ridge you can't see from here. Just a few outpost pines on this side of the island. South end of the island is much drier, but it has just an amazing, what look like shrubby plants here are actually uh, lichens growing all of, of very many different colors growing all over the volcanic rocks. Very rich environment, uh, very clean air. A lot of these lichens have suffered along our Southern California coast because they're very intolerant of poor air quality. Another view of that south end of the island, just a really stark and dramatic landscape, the volcanic landscape of the island. As I mentioned, uh, as we were going over the map, there are a few places where people live on the island. One is this beautiful little uh, biological field station up near the Cypress Grove, near the north end of the island. And this is right on the front porch of that field station. This is the son of one of the cooks who lived out at the field station. The dogs that he's making friends with were actually feral dogs on the island. There were a whole bunch of dogs that nobody was taking care of on the island. Um, the island conservation and conservación de islas folks have, have removed all of those feral dogs from the island and they've a lot of them are living now on the mainland of, of Baja. But this is Alan with a bunch of his dog friends. 
Uh, there's another place, Northeast Anchorage, which I showed you on the map, where there is a seasonal camp over there. There's the cooperative fish camp on the west side, and then finally the Navy base down at the south end of the island. There originally was a really neat cabin built out of cypress logs up in the, uh, near the cypress grove at the north end of the island. That has been turned into a wonderful field station with, here's a uh, internet access by uh, satellite which is just amazing. It's an amazing field station. They've built several uh, buildings there. They've piped water up from the spring. So there's even running water and hot showers at the field station, which is really, it's just an amazing place to stay. And this is the edge of the cypress grove right here. This is Northeast Anchorage, and there is an old road that's not really passable by vehicles now but zigzags up this hill and goes up to the spring up in the upper part of the island. Just a very simple camp down on the edge of the island and often used by the Mexican Navy. Guadalupe Island is, a, is closed to the public. It's only open to visitors with a permit. And the reason for that is that it's considered to be a um, ecological reserve with good reason. It's a very special place and the Mexican government really keeps it under control and does not allow um, just regular visitors unless you have permission from the Mexican government. So you can take your own boat? You can take your own boat but you're not allowed to land without a permit. And that's, that's true of several of the Mexican islands. Um, legally you can't really land on some of them without a permit. You have to arrange that ahead of time. The beaches are just teeming with elephant seals. This is one really important connection with our Southern California islands, and that is that the elephant seals that have populated our Southern California islands all came from Guadalupe Island because all of the ones in Southern California had been killed off by seal hunters. Only remaining animals were found on Guadalupe Island. And there's a very healthy population there now, and also that's repopulated the population on Guadalupe Island, repopulated our Southern California islands as far as we can tell. Just naturally moved up mm -hmm. over time, over a whole decades. Also the Guadalupe fur seal was almost hunted to extinction and now is really expanding its range as well. Occasionally seen as far north as our islands, but also um, really spreading to San Benito Island, and the south end of Guadalupe Island. When I first started going out there in the, the 1980s, early 1980s, the fur seals were very rare out there then, but they've really expanded in recent years. Here's a group that had a permit to go to Guadalupe. This is a group of botanists from uh, California Native Plant Society or the Palm Society of Southern California. Uh, both of those groups have had permission to go this is the um, Reed Morin. I'll tell you more about him in a minute. This is Reed Morin who, the result of his writing this book, The Flora of Guadalupe Island, is that the goats were finally removed from the island because it was, he pointed out just the, how important it was to remove those goats. This is Bob Thorne from Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden also along on that group, and then a whole bunch of folks from other parts of California. This is the um, cooperative fish camp on the west side of the island, just a very, again, a very simple camp. One um, interaction between this fish camp and visitors from Southern California is with the, there's a lot of people going down to see white, great white sharks. Guadalupe Island and they're really causing problems for the fishermen here because they're encouraging the sharks to come near people. They're going, you know, putting cages in the water and really encouraging the sharks to come near people. And it's really terrifying the, for the, the Mexican fishermen because they're, that's their livelihood. They are in those waters every day and they, it's really causing a lot of um, concerns for them because 
um, of those uh, boats from Southern California that are going down there. This is the Navy base down at the south end of the island. And there's a trail that goes up past a beautiful little chapel. And from here, you can get a great view of both inner islet, this massive rock here, and then outer islet over here. And I'll show you more about those in a minute. But inner islet is one of the places this was unexplored by um, humans, as far as we know, until the year 2000, when San Diego Museum of Natural History was able to get a helicopter down to Guadalupe and land up on the top of the island. There were, before that time, there were several um, different plans. One was to have mountain climbers climb up the face of the rock. Um, Yvonne Chouinard and others were really interested in climbing up inner islet, but it never really happened. They were, I think, trying to get funding from National Geographic, and that didn't really happen. But the, um, eventually there was funding, and in the year 2000, John Redman and others from the San Diego Museum of Natural History were able to land on top of inner islet. They were expecting to find amazing plants that hadn't been seen elsewhere on the island, but they really didn't find anything unexpected, but they just were able to finally confirm what was on inner island. Before then, the man that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Reed Morin, he would sail around on the water with a small boat. Basically, his only method of collecting plants from inner islet was with a shotgun. He could <laughs> shoot up, up the hill, you know, up the slope of the island and break off pieces of uh, plants that were hanging over the edge. It's amazing what botanists will do. <laughs> Here's another more views of the, uh, the Navy base at the south end of the island. Vehicles are extremely rare on the island. There are only a few trucks on the island, and we certainly made use of them whenever we had a chance to uh, load them up and uh, explore different parts of the island. Up on Mount Augusta, there's some really neat old historic graffiti. Here you can see the date 1879. And a whole bunch, there's a whole bunch of, it's a really interesting um, record of a lot of the expeditions and just individual boaters who have been out to Guadalupe Island. There have been a lot of botanists on the island because of the unique plants that grow out there. Starting in 1875, Edward Palmer, who's shown here, was able to go to the island, and goats had already been introduced out there by the time that Edward Palmer made it to the island. You'll recognize some of the other botanists who've been out there because they also came to our Southern California islands, and that's Edward Lee Green, who collected a lot on, he collected on Guadalupe in 1885, but went to Santa Cruz Island in 1886 and made the first botanical, uh, or really published the results of the first botanical collections on Santa Cruz Island off our coast. Franceschi was a well-known um, horticulturist in Santa Barbara, and he was the first one to bring the Santa Cruz Island ironwood to the mainland, actually brought a piece of a young plant of ironwood to the mainland and got it growing in the Santa Barbara area. The Brandigues also were really important collectors on our islands. And there's a whole list of, these are just a few of the different botanists who've been to Guadalupe Island in the 1900s, but you'll recognize especially Reed Morin's name now, who spent 40 years exploring the island and here he's shown with one of his plant presses on the right-hand side. Just an amazing friend and wonderful person who really, because of his work, the goats were finally removed from Guadalupe Island, and the island is just recovering in an amazing way. The flora is extremely unique because there are 56 plants that are found in one case, either on more than one of our California islands, 20 plants in that category, 36 which are found only on Guadalupe Island. So about 222 plants total for the island flora. There are lots of the 
Endemics are presumed to be extinct, including one of the paintbrushes. The first one there, Castilea. This anthelium is a, a native grass that was known only from, and these are the years that they were last seen on the island, the years in parentheses after the plant name. And I apologize for using scientific names only for these plants, but many of them, because they are so unique, do not have common names. The dysanthelium is a native grass which was found on Guadalupe Island first, but then also found on Catalina Island and San Clemente Island off our coast. It's been rediscovered on both Catalina and San introduced to the island by the late 1850s, and hunters started shooting lots of goats out there. They, they shot thousands of goats on the island between the 1860s and the early 1900s. There was actually even a cannery in Northeast Anchorage in the early 1930s. There were government-sponsored goat hunts there in 1971 to try to reduce the number. And finally, in 2002, there was a major effort started to uh, remove the goats from the island. And I'll say more about that as we get to some of the other slides. They were finally removed from the island in the year 2006. If you went to the island as I first did in the early 80s, you could just see herds of goats all over the island and virtually no living plants on the majority of the island. Here you can see they've just ravaged the hillsides. You could take similar, find similar images to this from San Clemente Island and other of our Southern California islands, Santa Cruz Island, with sheep on Santa Cruz Island, but the goats on San Clemente and also on Guadalupe were just having a tremendous effect on the plants out there. Because the Navy base is down on the south end of the island, that did not suffer nearly as much. And even when the goats were there, because they would hunt goats that came near their camp at the south end, but it was also much drier and the goats were mostly up near the water up at the north end. So they didn't really venture down to the south end much at all. But here you can really see the uh, just uh, how much vegetation there was down on the south end of the island, even when the goats were there. And then as I mentioned, inner islet and outer islet is where the goats were never found. Here's a closer view of inner islet. And outer islet does not look much more hospitable from most sides of it, but if you go around the north side of it, it doesn't look like it'd be easy to get to here. But here, there is a dip that you can get to. It looks like it'd be, oh, Great, we'll go land over there. The day we decided to go there, there was a 20-foot swell. So here you can see, uh, basically we had to land on these rocks right here. So if you missed, if you missed the top of that water, you would be 20 feet underwater and the next wave came in. It was really an exciting trip out there. <laughs> Here's a small dinghy heading out to, the, to go land on the island. And that's where you have to land. Once you get up there, though, it's just amazing. I was so excited to be on Outer Islet that I never even took off my life jacket. I had worn a life jacket on the boat, and I kept it on. I was just didn't want to waste a minute taking it off. And maybe just the experience of landing there, I just felt like I needed it in case I rode wave came ashore or something, but it was, it was just amazing to get up into this crater on the island and see just the amazing assemblage of plants which we did not see on the main island at all. There were virtually none of these plants were on the island, uh, the main part of the island. And I'll, this is a unique Dudleya, surprisingly called Dudleya guadalupensis for Guadalupe Island. It's only known from Guadalupe Island. And it's known, it's very unique because it has these, there are actually two endemic Dudleyas on Guadalupe. The one grows down at the south end of the island, the other one up at the north end. But this one has these long, tortuous, curved inflorescences or flower stalks, which is really a unique feature of Dudleyas. Here's a Stephanomeria in the sunflower family, which also is known only from Guadalupe Island. When I first went there in the 1980s, was only known from Outer Islet, but now has been spreading over a lot of the island now that the goats are gone. 
closer view of these. We had this growing in Santa Barbara for a while at the Botanic Garden, but it is not there any longer. Another plant is this very unusual succulent called Cystanthe or Tolinum wadalupensis um, that has beautiful long flowering stalks on it. Here you can see these long stalks that are laying on the ground here. But if you catch it in a flower, this is what the flowers look like. Really amazing. There, and we, there is a tolinum that's grown in horticulture that re, is very reminiscent of this plant. This is one of the island mallows, uh, Lavatera lindsayi, named for George Lindsay, who was at the San Diego Museum of Natural History. And this is unique for having its, first of all, its very gray or silvery leaves, and then these pendulous flowers. Again, only known from Guadalupe Island. This is Lavatera, another island mallow, Lavatera occidentalis. This one also grows on Los Coronados Island near our boundary with Mexico. This is a buckwheat, Areogonum sapatoense, the another name for um, inner islet or outer islet is Islote sapato. So this is named for outer islet. And this buckwheat is an interesting shrubby buckwheat that's only known from that islet. Here's a view of those island, the islets offshore and the south end of the island again. And in one of the ravines there, even when the goats were there, you could find a beautiful endemic lupin, Lupinus nivius, found again only on Guadalupe Island. There's a closer view of it. And as the goats have been removed, Lupinus nivius has really spread on the island. It's moved much farther north on the island and the leaves are get to be gigantic. They get to be the size of your palm. It's really a very interesting, very silvery, beautiful silvery foliage on it. One of our native lupins. We have a lot of native lupins, and some of which are endemic um, to the islands, but this one is an especially nice one. This is one of the tar plants or tar weeds. It used to be in the genus Hemazonia, named, this is Deanandra, named for Edward Lee Green, who was one of the first people to find it. It's this green sprawling shrub here. Again, endemic. Uh, there is, here is a mix of lichens and also a silvery relative of that Deanandra we just saw in the last slide. This is a different Deanandra. Here's a closer view of the lichens on the rocks. Then also this beautiful silvery shrub named for Edward Palmer. This is Palmer's um, island tarweed, you could call it. Closer view of the flowers of that. Another uh, paintbrush. There's one that's presumed to be extinct, but this is still another one that is endemic to only to Guadalupe Island. This is a little um, trifolium or clover, which has, makes it all the way up to West Anacapa Island, doesn't go any further north and is only found on the Southern California and Baja California Islands. But it was first found on Guadalupe Island by Edward Palmer. Down on this southwestern side of the island, you can find things like this Baryopsis, which is not only endemic at the species level, but found at the genus level only on Guadalupe Island. A beautiful little member of the sunflower family. Very unique flowers on it. A little uh, fish hook cactus. If you look really carefully, you may be able to see the hooked spines on it. Another one of the endemics. This is a beautiful little native poppy that again is endemic only to Guadalupe Island. The Scholzia palmeri, and this gets to be, it can be a small shrub. This is a very small individual, but it's a really hardy perennial that grows for many years and can get really large now that the goats have been removed from the island. While the goats were still there, they would occasionally eat it back, so it never got to be, never saw large plants of it. So in 2001, the goats, the goat roundup started on the island. The, the Mexican government worked out a deal with 
um, um, farmers who from Sonora who wanted to take some of the goats off Guadalupe Island, and they actually allowed them to take the goats off on the Mexican Navy boats. So they rounded them up. This is that cabin up in the Cypress Grove. So they were rounding them up, and they had to transport them way from the north end of the island here in, a, in the back of a truck and also in a little trailer, and then take them off to the, take them off by boat back to the mainland. But they rounded up a bunch of them, and the way they did it was really um, ingenious. They basically made use of the water holes on the island, and they fenced off all of the water holes on the island, but built a ramp going up from inside the cage. Actually, going up from the outside of the cage, they, would, they built a ramp, so the animals would then drop off of that ramp into the fenced area and go get water. Once they had filled themselves with water, they were too heavy, and they couldn't get back up over the fence. So then they could just come and round them up. It was really an ingenious way to capture the goats. And th these water sources, there's only a few water sources on the island, and they were able to draw a lot of the goats in there. The limiting factor was getting them off the island. There were just not a lot of, there just were a lot of goats, but not an easy way to get a lot of them off the island because there aren't many vehicles on the island. And it's a couple hours road trip to get down to the south end of the island. So you can only carry maybe 15 goats at a time, and to get them down to the south end of the island was really tedious. But they they take them down to the Navy base, and then they could put them on a barge. Here you can see a barge taking them out to the Navy base, I mean to the Navy's boat. So they allowed, the, the Navy allowed, the cooperated with biologists on the island and with these um, um, goat ranchers to allow the, um, animals to be taken back to the mainland. That's when I first got involved on the island in terms of removing the goats was we were invited there to try to build some exclosures around the most sensitive plants on the island because they knew it was going to take a while to get rid of the goats or they thought it was going to take even longer than it did. But finally a lot of the goats were um, eliminated from the island through a series of removing them to the mainland and then also hunting them and Finally, they were isolated to a few areas, and they put radio collars on the remaining goats, or put radio collars on uh, the goats that they could capture, and then they would um, group up together and basically find each other. Before the goats were removed, these were the only kind of places, besides those islets offshore, you could find plants on these extremely steep cliffs. And again, crazy botanists were lassoing plants off the edge of the island to make a collection of them. This is, many of you know, I'm sure, Steve Timbrook, at, who was director at Lotus Land for many years. This was an expedition we were on. And Peter Schuyler, who I'm sure a lot of you know, is holding his feet, make sure he doesn't go off the edge. But he is, Steve is about 4,000 feet above the water. You know, if he fell off there, there would, there's no coming back. No shotgun. No shotgun. And if per, collecting something by a shotgun, that direction wouldn't really work if you're shooting downhill. But the, um, the pines were just getting devastated by the goats when they were there. There were dead pines all over the island. People could just look at a series of historic photos of the ridge, and you could just see the pine numbers declining. It was really a horrible situation, and you'd see outposts of what once was a very healthy pine forest, just devastated. It's a, a variety, a unique variety that grows on Guadalupe of the um, Pinus radiata, the Monterey pine. Even when we were there in the, um, in the 2000s, early 2000s, like 2001, the few pines that were left, there were no seedlings coming up underneath them. The, you can see the browse line on the bottom part of, they were eating, the goats were as high, high as they could reach for eating off all of the lower branches of the pine trees. Once we put exclosures around several of the pines, that's one of the areas where we built these fences with the help of the 
the goat herders who were out there, They're, they were experts at building fences and built some great fences to exclude the goats from the several of the pine groves. And you can see an amazing change. We didn't even realize how much they were eating. But as soon as we put up those fences, even from a satellite image, you could see these little green squares on the island because they were, they, it was the little island of green surrounded by devastation that the goats were causing. As the, as the number of goats went down on the island, this is a slide put together by uh, Luciana Luna, who worked on the island and still is working on the island. Um, she's with uh, Conservacion de Islas. But you can see numbers of goats declining. Over 10,000 goats were removed by 2006. And by 2004, they were really much lower numbers than were previously on the island. But you can also see the inverse relationship with cypress seedlings increasing. By 2006, there were over 41,000 cypress seedlings that showed up on the island, and nearly 4,000 pine seedlings that showed up by 2006 shown here. And by 2008, there were about 9,000 pine seedlings that they counted on the island. Luciana and her colleagues counted out there. But here you can see those same pines that we visited in 2001 are now just surrounded by young pine trees. It's just amazing how quickly it happened. All we had to do was fence that area off and keep the goats out. We also started finding other things inside those exclosures, like this Ceanothus, Ceanothus arboreus, our island Ceanothus, or mountain mahogany, that has never had never been seen on Guadalupe Island before. But it is an endemic, an island endemic that's found on our Southern California islands as well. Lotus grandifloris, a beautiful member of the pea family, was extremely rare on the island. Once the fences went up, it started growing everywhere. Little tiny annuals like this little Gathopsis, this is another Guadalupe Island endemic, um, showed up in amongst the rocks there. This is a view of the cypress grove, and we were seeing similar things happen in the cypress grove. These dead trees, in some cases, the dead trees kind of created exclosures on their own, and we took advantage of several of those and put fences around those. You can see the, the goats were not only eating the seedlings and any plants that would come up in the understory, but they were also stripping the bark off the trees. Here you can see recent damage from goats. There was a fire on in the Cypress Grove um, in about 19, I mean 2010 or so. I'll have to look at the date of that. But a lot of the trees that survived the initial burn didn't end up surviving because of these areas of bark that were gone. The fire continued to smolder in those wounded areas and burned off a lot of trees. But here we put some exclosures inside the cypress grove too. And especially here you can see these fallen logs have created kind of a barrier for the goats. We took advantage of that and just amplified on that and soon had all kinds of plants. Uh, this is a rare um, nightshade related to our island nightshade that grows on Santa Cruz Island. Selenum, it's like Selenum cloakii, but grows as a large colony rather than individual shrubs. It's a clonal plant. This is a beautiful little monkey flower that showed up outside of the exclosures, but in the, in the cypress grove. It was extremely rare on Guadalupe Island, and this is the closest relative of two little monkey flowers that have gone extinct on one on Catalina Island and one presumed to be extinct on Santa Cruz Island. But these three species are just amazing little monkey flowers that, and still are persisting on Guadalupe. Island Morning Glory came in like gangbusters after the goats were removed. One of the really important colonizing plants. You can see in amongst the trees here just amazing Cypress seedlings, two endemic shrubs to Guadalupe. I'll show you closer views of them in a minute. 
but just an amazing landscape. This was just bare ground before the goats were removed. It's really incredible. There also are some weeds coming in here. This is the hedge mustard coming up in big numbers. Same situation with the palms. No seedlings seen until the goats were removed. And then once the goats are removed, the, the, uh, bot the botanists and biologists on the island started seeing more and more seedlings of the palm coming up. Here you can see these palms on these, the only places they were able to survive, again, were on these really steep slopes. And if those adult trees died off, they were not going to be replaced because the goats were eating all the seedlings. This is gonna look very different in a few years. Just these isolated adult plants are now being replaced by young seedlings all around them. Here you can see more in the background. Island oaks were also being hammered. There was a, a oak canyon, which I pointed out earlier, on the east side of the island. There were about seven oaks in that canyon, and over the years they just kept being eroding away because the erosion was so great. The goats were just eating everything around them and causing tremendous erosion, similar to what you've seen on the peak, Soledad Peak area up on Santa Rosa Island where the roots are really exposed. Same thing was happening on Guadalupe Island. Here's a hillside, what it looked like when the goats were there. Notice all these trails, even on these steep rocky faces, hardly any plants, only in the steepest parts of the rocks. Nothing growing on this area here. But once the goats are removed, things really change quickly. Here you can see a lot of plants coming in on those steeper areas and also covering up a lot of their trails and coming up lots of morning glories coming up on those steep talus slopes. And in areas that were completely barren when the goats were there, just amazing mix of shrubs coming up, including this Sphoralcia palmeri and the mallow family. That was one of the early pioneers on the island. Here's another one another gray endemic called Senecio palmeri. And you can see Senecio coming up, all of these little gray marks on the hillsides here are shrubs that weren't there when the goats were there. Beautiful fields filled with island, endemic island poppies. Plants like this bulbous plant, Tritelia guadalupensis, which was only known from a few places on the island as doing much better now. Closer view of the flowers of that. So since the goats have been removed, and even before they were completely removed, uh, many plants have shown up, and these are the years they were last seen before the goats were removed. This is another Ceanothus. This is a member of the Phlox family, a member of the Mustard family, a member of uh, the um, it's related to urtica or nettles. This is a native tobacco, one of our gooseberries. This is a little member of the mint family that had last been seen in 1885. And here it is growing in the rocks, in the cracks between the rocks. So the seed bank was still there? Or the seed there bank was still there. After all that time, or just recently dropping from some of the adult plants and so forth? Hard to know. You know, it's, there were so many years that the plants weren't seen. It's hard to know if they came up every year, but then by the time people were there looking for them, the goats had eaten them for that year. It's possible that they were coming up every year, every couple of years, but then would get eaten back every year. This plant, uh, the, uh, they were still leaving some seeds. And the seeds were falling into these cracks in the rocks. So if any flowers were produced, the um, seeds would persist. But it's amazing that one Ceanothus arboreus that had never been seen on the island, we don't know if it had been there 200 years ago and nobody, you know, nobody saw it be during all those goat years or if it had been in isolated slopes and then once the goats were gone, it could get back up onto the flatter parts of the island. That's basically what we saw on Santa Cruz Island when the sheep were removed from Santa Cruz Island. A lot of plants we thought were only growing on the steep cliff faces then were found all over after the, the sheep numbers were reduced. This is Senecio palmeri, which was down to a very small 
uh, population of less than 50 plants probably on the island now is numbers in the thousands. Lots of seedlings right after the goats were removed. Again, on steep cliff faces, Prittily and Cana was never really in danger of being eliminated from the island, but it's another endemic shrub found only on Guadalupe Island. But there were places on the island where it was on steep, it does really well on steep cliffs, so it was able to persist. There, the bird populations are very small out there, but there are endemic birds. And Bernardo can tell us about the birds of Guadalupe Island. I think there was a shearwater that was... was junco? The junco is still there. The junco is, is still there. There was a, there was a caracara, which has now gone extinct. Um, and then also the um, there was a shearwater that was... What's that? Storm petrol, storm right. But you don't have many sheep, uh, birds. Not many, no. There aren't many seeds for them. Back. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what comes back. But on these steep cliffs, you can see um, shrubs coming up again. It's just incredible to see how the island has changed. Those earlier pictures I showed you of just barren landscapes are now, the shrubs are just coming up everywhere between the shrub, between the, the boulders. Here's that Lotus grandiflorus, another member of the pea family. How recent are your recent photos? Um, 2011 or 12, 2011, I think. But it's been just amazing how things have changed. Actually, 2010, I think, was the last time I was there on the island. These are um, some of the new discoveries on the island, a mix of native and non-native, those which are have an asterisk in front of them, like these two salt bushes are non-native. Here's the native ceanothus. This is our little uh, miner's lettuce, another species of miner's lettuce, a non-native member of the sunflower family, the non-native prickly, non prickly lettuce. This is Lonicera, one of the honeysuckles. Panacetum stasium, the fountain grass, showed up at the airstrip on Guadalupe. Schismus, the little Arabian grass that has really spread in our deserts. This is jojoba, which is native to Baja and Southern California. I'm not positive that it's native to Guadalupe Island, but it showed up there on its own, apparently. Yebi, a little member of the um, carrot family. This is a brand new plant, not, has not been described yet. It's um, a member of the sunflower family related to our everlastings that showed up after the goats were removed. And now it's very common up in the pines um, on the island, but will be des described soon as a new species and possibly a new genus. Some of the plants have been reduced to such a number that they're not really able to persist, including things like our common uh, coastal sagebrush, Crossosoma, which is found just on Catalina Island, San Clemente Island, and also Palos Verdes Peninsula, is really very rare on Guadalupe now. This is one of the bed straws. Melasma lorina, believe it or not, is laurel sumac, which is very common in Southern California, but now is only known from a couple of plants on the island. This is the island red berry, and also a figwort that's found only elsewhere on um, San Clemente Island and Catalina. This is a, a close view of the Crossosoma californicum that I mentioned now just grows on very small populations on Guadalupe, but also is common on Catalina, about 50 to 60 individual plants on San Clemente Island, and then also the uh, small population at Palos Verdes Peninsula. This is a picture, difficult to see, of melasma, a big giant laurel sumac, which was hanging down the cliff and had been seen for years by people. It eventually fell off, broke off the cliff face, but the upper part of it stayed rooted 
and is now re-sprouting. It's now a much smaller plant up in here, but it has survived and hopefully will continue to live there. There are a number of non-native plants that unfortunately that have been introduced to the island. One of the worst is the tree tobacco, which was found there in 1948. It has acted as an important um, nectar source for hummingbirds on the island, but it has really taken over a lot of the north end of the island. Some of these others, a couple of non-native salt bushes, first made it there in the year 2000. Others, as recently, like this prickly lettuce, is really spread on the island now, since just in the nine years since it was first found out there. These two hedge mustards, Cesimbriums, this one is really spread on the island in some years, but in other years, not so much. So hopefully it has um, reached an equilibrium out there and hopefully won't be as much of a problem as we thought. Here's areas just covered with tree tobacco, which it was helping reduce erosion on the island, but not allowing for any native plants to get established. And um, just an amazing, very invasive weed. This is one year of Cesimbrium orientale, the, the one of the hedge mustards out there. It just covered the whole landscape, but again, it was cutting down on erosion and acted as a kind of a colonizer to produce some soil. And natives have now, native shrubs have come up and replaced it in the areas where it was common. So it's, it's gonna be a long road to full recovery for Guadalupe Island, but it's well on the way to making just an amazing recovery. I feel really lucky to have been able to see it for, go from one of the best examples of an island that was in dire trouble to an island that is now recovering because of the efforts of groups both here in the United States and also with very amazing support from the Mexican government the Conservación de Islas in Ensenada, and also the Mexican Navy, who really has um, pitched in to help remove goats from the island, and also bringing supplies out to the island all the time. It's been just, a, it was started off as a really an amazing um, binational effort to really help the plants of Guadalupe Island, starting back when Reed Morin published his flora for the island and really made the folks at Island Conservation realize they're, this is way bigger than any project we've ever done, but it's just something we have to do, and they actually did it. It's just an amazing story of recovery, and it's a, an amazing story of cooperation between a number of different individuals and groups who've made it all happen. Similar to what's happened on a lot of our Southern California islands, just the removal of feral animals and the amazing effects that that has had on the uh, special plants of the islands that they have been um, removed from. But thanks for coming tonight, and it's been uh, it's really amazing to uh, <laughs> see so many people. Thank you, Steve. That's so inspirational. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions, if you're okay with that. Do we sure. have bur any burning questions? How about you? Yeah, I just was wondering, are there any, um, are the insects coming back? Are there any insects that are endemic to there, since the plants are starting to come back and everything? I, you know, I don't know about the, whether the insects, whether there are many endemics. The insect fauna has been very um, little studied because for so many years there were so few plants on the island. But there, um, there are, I know Conservación de Islas is, um, has had entomologists out there who are looking at the um, insects on the island. One year when we were camping out out there, had an amazing experience. I've never seen so many moths. They, as soon as the light would go down in the evening and they, if you shined your light on them, they had amazing orange, their eyes would reflect an orange color. So you could shine your light and just see all of these orange eyes all around you. And they, as we were trying to cook our food or, you know, just camp that night, 
the, um, the, these moths literally were everywhere. As soon as you'd get food out, they would be, you'd have 10 or 15 moths on it right away. And some of those moths didn't make it through the night because they were getting all over our food. And the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the next morning, the juncos who live in the cypress trees there would come and pick up all of the, uh, uh, just, they were, it was just a feast for them. Great breakfast for them. And it was really neat. That's an amazing part of camping or staying at that cypress grove on the island. You're hearing these amazing endemic birds in the morning as you're waking up. It's just incredible to hear them and growing in the endemic cypress trees and be surrounded by these endemic birds. It was really an amazing experience. We have another question. No, no reptiles at all on the island. No, no amphibians, no reptiles. It's so isolated. We are videotaping and this will be online um, after this talk tonight. And so I am gonna try, if you have a question, if you can wait till I bring the microphone, that way we can capture your question. You were talking about the insects. How about bees and you know, for pollinization anymore? Or, or, or did the moths do the, do the pollination? Haven't, haven't noticed a lot of bees on the island myself. I just don't know what their abundance is. I don't really know anything about the, the insect fauna of the island. So how are the plants pollinated? I don't know what their pollinators are. Some of them are wind pollinated. So they're able to spread without insects, but obviously there are there certainly are insects out there. I just haven't spent a lot of time looking at pollinators, and that's a really important part of the continued recovery of the island. Maybe we'll just do one more question, and then I'm sure that Steve would be willing to stay afterwards and talk sure, with people a little sure. bit. Okay, how about Bill? I'll do you in the back. Are, there are no reptiles at all. No. No amphibians, no reptiles on the island at all. My, my question was just how, uh, how many goats were on the island? Oh, it varied, you know, during whichever period of time you're talking about. But the last effort to remove goats from the island, they removed over 10,000 animals, a combination of hunting them and also removing many of them to Sonora to the, the goats on Guadalupe really got an amazing reputation for being, you know, very um, strong animals able to persist with very little water. So they were really uh, coveted in other parts of Mexico and they have been taken to the mainland. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. That's a, Thanks for coming. a great story of inspiration. Thanks all of you.